2022 Stahl Center Distinguished Lecturer. I'm Joel Berkowitz, Director of the Sam and Helen Stahl Center for Jewish Studies and Professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. The Distinguished Lecture is one of the Stahl Center's signature annual events, uh, or it was annual before COVID, and this is actually, the, it was our first casualty as a public program of COVID, and we are finally getting back to it. Uh, it has given us an opportunity to learn from leading scholars in Jewish studies and adjacent fields. This year's distinguished lecturer is my colleague and friend and a dear friend of the Stahl Center, Professor Ruth Schwertfeger. Previous lecturers in this series, which was launched in 2016 with the generous support of the Bay Foundation, include Michael Twitty, Jeffrey Chandler, and Barbara Kirschenblatt-Gimblet. We are honored to add to the series with Ruth's talk tonight based on her research in the archives of a Nazi concentration camp whose story needs to be told. Before we introduce our speaker, a few words of thanks and a couple of logistical notes. We appreciate the involvement of our co-sponsors, the Nathan and Esther Peltz Holocaust Education Resource Center, UWM's Goldemir Library, which is where we are coming to you from, the Departments of Ancient and Modern Languages, Literatures and Cultures, Global Studies and History at UWM, and by UWM's German program and the program in Russian and East European Studies. Thanks as well to the Stahl Center's Administrative Assistant, Susan Wade, for logistical support, to Jay Piney in Classroom Services for his expertise in making our first hybrid event ever run smoothly, to the Bay Foundation for its continued support, and to the Stahl Center's Deputy Director, Rachel Baum, who did most of the heavy lifting to organize tonight's event, and I'm very grateful. Uh, I will turn the podium over to Rachel in a moment. Um, just two uh, other points to, um, to note. Uh, one is that we will leave time for questions and answers, both from the floor here and online. So if you are joining us virtually, uh, then do feel free to drop questions in the Q&A, uh, and uh, we will be monitoring that and selecting questions from there. Um, also, uh, those of you who are in the room here, those of you online will find other ways to follow up with you, um, but we've left survey cards, feedback cards for you. Um, we would love to hear what you think, and we would love to, uh, those of you who are not already on our mailing list, to add you so we can keep in touch with you uh, for um, your future events. Um, and as an incentive to uh, encourage you to fill those out, um, we will uh, pick one completed survey card um, from the box uh, that we'll put it in, and we will send you a copy of Ruth's book. And now it's my great pleasure to turn this over to my colleague Rachel Baum uh, to introduce our speaker. I was willing to arm wrestle Joel for the privilege of introducing Ruth, but it turned out not to be necessary because Joel is so gracious. It is my honor to introduce Ruth Schwertfeger. I've had the pleasure of being Ruth's friend and colleague for 25 years. But before that, I was her student because she was on my dissertation committee in 1997. Ruth Schwertfeger taught at UWM for four decades before retiring and becoming Professor Emerita of German. She is quite beloved and her good humor and cups of tea are dearly missed in the department. But I'll focus on her scholarly work here today. From Ruth, I learned a profound truth that you will see exemplified in her presentation tonight, and that shaped my own approach to teaching and learning about the Holocaust. And that is, listen for the stories that aren't being told. This central commitment runs throughout Dr. Schwartfeger's five books, which ask, how can the scholar's voice be used to uncover the hidden voices of the past? Her first book, which came out in 1989, was The Women of Theresienstadt, Voices from a Concentration Camp. Who was talking about Theresienstadt in 1989, let alone the experiences of women? No one, except Ruth. She went on to publish four other books that brought to light important stories, including Elsa Lasker Schuler, Inside This Deathly Solitude, In Transit, Narratives of German Jews in Exile, Flight, and Internment, 
during the dark years of France, and a memoir about her own childhood in Northern Ireland, the wee wild one, stories of Belfast and beyond. Today, she is sharing groundbreaking research from her latest book, A Nazi Camp Near Danzig, Perspectives on Shame and on the Holocaust from Stutthof, which was published this year by Bloomsbury Press. I'm glad that the story of Ruth Schwartfeger's own importance to German and Holocaust studies at UWM in Wisconsin and in the field more broadly is now being told. Her contributions to the university were recently celebrated at UWM's fall award ceremony when the chancellor presented Dr. Schwartfeger with the Ernest Spates Plaza Award. Inclusion on the Spates Plaza marker outside of the student union is one of the highest honors awarded by UWM to a member of the university community. And it is an enduring means by which the institution pays a timeless tribute to colleagues who have made significant and lasting contributions to the university. This is also a full circle moment. In 1997, UWM partnered with the Wisconsin Society for Jewish Learning to present a Holocaust conference in this very room. Ruth and I both presented papers. I can't remember if Nathan Berkowitz was president of the Wisconsin Society for Jewish Learning at that time, but he was one of its founders. And today's lecture is sponsored by his descendants through the Center for Jewish Studies that bears their family name. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Emerita Ruth Schwartfeger to share her work. What can I say after that? That's very, very touching. And I'm surrounded by friends, dear friends whom I've known for, for so many years and have loved dearly. So I, I want to start by simply thanking you all for, for coming tonight on this lovely autumn evening. You could be at home poking the fire a bit, couldn't you? But yet you came to hear about Stutthof. And I hope you leave knowing more about this dreadful case. So together, uh, we want to acknowledge our, our gratitude to the Style Center uh, and my friends uh, Joel and Rachel, who have run this place so, so well for so many years. They have supported me throughout my research, so I cannot frankly thank them enough. And then uh, HERC, or the Holocaust Education Resource Center, uh, I'm very happy to be supported by them tonight. And of course, our own library, the Golda Meir Library. Boy, I would love a dollar for every hour I've spent here. I'd be a very rich woman, believe me. So we thank them for keeping on the lights tonight, uh, and we'll not keep them up uh, too late. And then to um, these dear people out there uh, joining us virtually, well, uh, and apparently you come from thither and yonder, uh, according to our uh, sources here. So we welcome you. Um, I've actually told uh, dear Jay here to lower my uh, decibels a little bit with my vowels, my Irish vowels, that tend to clang around uh, all over space. So uh, I'm sure you'll do a good job of that. Just lower the register just a wee bit, please. Okay, so I hope you all uh, can understand me. This has been a very, very long journey. This is the book I have written. It's called A Nazi Camp Near Danzig, Perspectives on Shame and on the Holocaust from Stutthof. In other words, what it is not, it's not the history of Stutthof. It probably couldn't even be called a micro history of Stutthof. Um, what I have done is um, gleaned from the research I've put into this for quite a few years. Uh, let me start by telling you how I ever came to go to Stutthof and then how I approached uh, Stutthof. So I first visited uh, this area, this Danzig area, uh, about eight years ago. 
And we had been exploring and along the Baltic. I love the sea. There's just nothing like the sea, is there? Uh, and don't tell me Lake Michigan can, can compete. It doesn't. It's a big fraud because it doesn't smell of salt. So we have been exploring ar around uh, the Baltic. And of course, I tend to know places uh, through literature. So for example, if you ever go to Berlin, I can give you a 19th century tour of Berlin through the eyes of Fontana. That's the way I see the world. I always have. So try me on Dublin with Joyce, and I'll show you uh, around there too. So um, I knew Stutthof from a chap called Gunter Grass. Now that chap is a very famous Nobel Prize winner. And I'll never forget uh, teaching uh, the stories that this Gunter Graz wrote to my seminars here on, on campus. And I'm not sure if they liked them and responded as warmly as I did, but we had a great time with them. And I knew that Stutthof was a very sinister place. I'll never forget one line in, in one of his uh, stories. You better shut up or you'll end up in Stutthof. Now that's enough to draw someone in. What is this Stutthof? Well, we were in Gdańsk and it was pouring with rain. I've never seen anything like Baltic rains. They, they make Irish rain look like a wee dribble. Never seen anything. So we scurried indoors. We ended up in the Baltic Museum. And we were attempting to make sense of Polish, uh, not doing a very good job. And this chap approached us, uh, who was a volunteer there. And uh, he explained what we were looking at. And we got into a nice chat. And he found out what we did, and that I was involved in, in German Jewish literature and research. And he volunteered to take us out to Stutthof. Imagine that. So off we went the next day, and we met the archivist there. And I emerged from the archives of Stutthof with a heavy bag of books. Now I hear you ask, but you speak Polish? No, I don't. And I explained that to them. Well, there's no point even thinking about doing research on Stutthof because I don't speak Polish. And they pointed out to me that many of their main, their primary sources were translated into German. So I uh, agreed to have a look and I lumbered out of there with all these uh, books, uh, translations uh, from uh, Polish into German. And that uh, is how my journey started. Not that I wasn't acquainted with the name of the camp. I want to emphasize that right from the beginning. Um, I knew so much about it through Gunter Grass, but I certainly did want to learn more. Well, Gunter Grass is possibly not the best person to start with when you are doing something uh, on a camp like Stutthof, because his references to Stutthof were invariably uh, very oblique and indirect and um, hard to fathom what was behind this. Well, I attempted to. Let me read to you what the uh, committee for the Nobel Prize said about uh, Gunter Grass's Blechtrommel or the tin drum. They called his depiction, I quote, the forgotten face of history. So Stutthof, I write, is part of that forgotten history. Grass confronted the Nazi past in the Danzig trilogy. That's what these three uh, fictions were called later, actually by uh, a professor at, at Oxford, John Reddick, that's what he referred to them at. So 
Brass himself never called them that, but they were called that later. So his depictions of the pre-war regional history of Danzig and Pomerania are specific and imbued with authentically regional flavor and vibrancy. But when it comes to Stutthof, he is selective and he presents the camp in snapshot form, in metaphors, in brief anecdotes about minor characters or in rumors about shocking atrocities. While this oblique treatment of suffering underscores rather than obscures the camp's bleakness and cruelty, it also contributes to the silence that has lingered over Grass's relationship to local history, including the destruction of a community that he portrayed so effectively in his fiction. In the course of his long life, his responses to German history, both in fictional works and in memoirs, included his attempt in a memoir called Crab Walk, translated Crab Walk, Krebsgang, published in English in 02, to write about other sufferings, like the anguish of displaced Germans in 1945. There is, however, one mem memoir that posed a major problem for Grass and his readers. In August 2006, in an interview, the 79-year-old Grass revealed that he had served in his late teens for a short period in 1944 in the Waffen SS. He had, of course, never hidden the fact that as a young man he had been enamored with the Nazi movement and fervently hoped that Hitler would win. But this public admission was different and gave instant fuel to his detractors to deride the hypocrisy of a man who for years had made a name for himself as a defender of democratic values and had scolded those countries who had failed to do so. So I go on to explain how grass scholars deal with this contradiction. And I continue. I take very seriously Grass's response to the outpouring of support and of condemnation, by the way, from people like Rushdie. He speaks of the shame that he felt for having been in the SS as a young man, a 17 year old. We do not need to dissect the probity of his life after 1945, to take his public confession of shame seriously. I do not view his confession as a casual throwaway line, but rather as a truth that has left a discernible mark on both his fiction and on his biographical writings. Though there are few comments directly about Stutthof, and even those are veiled, one senses that Grass's discomfort with the subject hits very close to home. I was presenting my scholarship in Warsaw a few years ago, and there was a scholar there in sociology who afterwards really went after me. And he said, you're far too light on Gunter Grass. You should have done a better job dissecting him, in other words. So what do you say? Well, I, I claimed um, Irish mercy <laughs> that had guided me in, in my life a lot anyway, and that I looked at his shame as something that was very real. I didn't deny it, 
And I think the book will make that very, very clear of how I deal with it. But shame is, is awful. And to live with shame uh, for so long, um, that's hard. So what did he then uh, have to say about uh, this camp? Let me draw an example from one of the characters in his books. I quote, they took him to Stutthof, and there he stayed, a dismal, complicated story, which deserves to be written, but by someone else, not by me, end quote. By conceding that the story deserves to be written, though not by him, Grass is taking his leave, and I suggest admitting the limitations of fiction in the face of facts. That distinction will be clear in the chapters that follow. He goes on to say about his time in the Waffen SS for decades, I refused to admit the word and the double letters, SS. What I had accepted with the stupid pride of youth, I wanted to conceal after the war out of a recurrent sense of shame. But the burden remained and no one could alleviate it. I will have to live with it the rest of my life. I'd like to say at this point that um, shortly before Grass died, I actually wrote to uh, his secretary and, and asked some of these questions. I mean, how he dealt with this now, uh, uh, clearly I knew he had been ill, but he was very, very gravely ill. And sadly, uh, I did not get any reply to that. But um, I offer this because I did not go into uh, Stutthof with this knowledge that I had from Gunter Grass in any kind of, shall we say, prideful way that I was going to set the, the record straight here. Uh, on the contrary, I was deeply um, moved by his sense of shame because that shame clearly emanated from the circumstances in the camp. The camp was absolutely awful. And so many memoirs refer to it as, as hell. Well, I know that in general, Holocaust memoirs often use that word hell. But in the case of Stutthof, uh, they give very, very specific reasons why this place uh, was such a hell right from the beginning. So uh, just, uh, we need to keep an eye here on my time because I, I, I want to move on here. There were several phases uh, in the camp's development when war bro broke out, as you know, I'm just assuming that you're all armchair historians, at least that, and I know there are some quite distinguished historians in our midst. Um, but um, it began in 1939, but they were well prepared. They had been working for several years preparing this camp in what they called a Waldlager. So it was off the beaten track in this very sylvan kind of setting that you would go for a holiday to. But they were busy preparing to, to go in and arrest anyone who was vaguely dissident. By that I mean if you were Jewish or if you were Polish. Now the Jewish community had already, it was a small community uh, to begin with, there were only several thousand left uh, after Kristallnacht, the night of, of broken glass, and they had been able uh, to get out in time. For those who were left, it was a, a miserable existence. 
And they were targeted for one reason, that they, they were Jewish. And the other uh, group, the other cohort that they wanted to get and get into the Stutthof as fast as they could, uh, were the professional people from the Polish community. And they went after them. And when war broke out, they were ready. They already had their lists all made up. They knew exactly who they were going to bring in. So they had about 1,500 on that list in, in 1939. And they housed them initially in a school called Victoria School. I have my granddaughter, Victoria, here tonight with us. That's sad, isn't it, Victoria? They, that's where they housed them. And then they brought in the trucks and they uh, transported them uh, to the camp. And in the beginning years of the camp, these local people had to build the barracks, had to do all their own work. There were some carpenters among them. So they actually uh, built the barracks that some of them were going to live in uh, until 1945. So, um, you can tell my sensibility of how I approach this initially, certainly uh, through grass. But after two chapters, believe me, grass recedes totally. And the ones then who speak are as dear Rachel actually put it so well that I'm interested in hearing from the people that you normally may not hear from. And I listen up to them. So uh, I would like to uh, read with you um, some of the uh, memoirs. I mean, I think this would be very suitable uh, for our audience tonight that I have uh, chosen to represent this place. So first of all, you have it as a, a camp um, that was used to intern dissidents civil prisoners, as they called them. And then the next phase began to grow. They went into Pomerania, and they uh, used a net to, to catch all from the villages and from the so-called uh, Polish corridor. Others, uh, anyone that, that they felt uh, belonged in Stutthof, and they brought them in. So now it's an, an, a labor internment camp. And uh, the next phase, and that was what they were aspiring to be, which was a bona fide concentration camp. That didn't happen until January uh, of 1942. And uh, in, Jan in November of 1941, Heinrich Himmler came visiting. And he inspected the camp. The, the archives have some uh, photographs of him walking around with the local SS, looking very proud, and uh, giving it uh, a good examination. Was it worthy of being called a concentration camp? It's perverse, but that's exactly uh, what he was looking for. Marks that would uh, define it as a place uh, that could be called a concentration camp of the Third Reich. What I do in that um, phase is I ask the archivists for the files of young men who worked in the camp and who were from Danzig. I wanted to see how locals were treating these prisoners, some of them, you know, their neighbors. And to me, that took a lot of time. And they were very kindly, they, they, they sent me a, a spreadsheet. And I had 270 names. And of course, the first thing you recognize about those names is that some of them were well, most of them that were Polish had to be Germanized. That was the first thing they did. So the central argument and thesis of, of my book is, uh, its motif, if you will, is that it turns on the notion of what is Germandom, Deutschtum. 
And essentially, that's what they were using to eliminate, eliminate those who were not Deutsch. And of course, they start with, with the Jews and uh, then the, the Polish priests. They put them together. And uh, I would like to read a little excerpt uh, from uh, a memoir written by uh, a priest to give you an idea of how they were treating uh, both Jews and Polish priests. This man's name is Malik, Heinrich Malik. Um, he's one of the priests I'm reading who despite his maltreatment, frequently comments that the Jewish prisoners suffered even more and would not survive. These observations are particularly valuable to researchers in the absence of memoirs written in these early days by Jewish victims. The empathy is more than the recognition of a common fate of suffering. They had been bracketed together when they arrived at the camp as Juden und Pfaffen, Jews and Popes to demean both groups. But because Nazi racial laws had segregated Jews to the lowest possible category, the inclusion with priests implied an even stronger insult to priests. As the excerpt below illustrates, the representation of Jewish maltreatment surpasses that of other prisoners. Malik was a member of a unit that worked in the forest all day in freezing rain. When they finally returned to the camp in the evening, they often were deprived of their evening soup. This is how he describes it. It often happens that the SS man standing by the bath allows a prisoner to take food, but then gives the order, bend over and beats him with a person's club. He beats and beats. Woe to the bent over prisoner if he spills any of the liquid moving around in his tin. Then he has to pour the rest back into the vat and take another beating for wasting food. This happens most often to the group of Jews. There was not a day when they were not mistreated especially during the distribution of food rations. Often they were driven away without any food, unfortunate ones. Much worse off than we, the priests, although the SS men usually persecute Juden und Pfaffen. Let me pause here to tell you about this uh, priest, Malak. Um, when I, I, I tried very hard to find out everything I could about the people either I found in a document in the archive or in a memoir. Um, and in this case, I found out that this gentleman had ended up in Pulaski, Wisconsin. And uh, of course, I went right there, knocked on the door of the friary. And um, did my best to explain why I was there. And they brought my husband and me in, and we sat down. And I said that I was writing this book on, on, on Stutthof, and I understood that one of their friars had been there. Oh, Father Malik, oh yes, and he died and told me. I said, I'd love to visit his grave, because I would like to pay my respects. And I had, you have to be so careful in doing research because I'd actually read somewhere that he was buried in Wisconsin. I think it was just the, uh, it was presumed that because he had gone there, he's buried there. So it's, oh no, he's not buried here at all. Uh, he's buried in Illinois and gave me the name of the place in, in Illinois. Well, they told me about uh, what poor health this 
dear man had, how he was bent over with rheumatism. He could hardly walk, etc. I told them about why he had rheumatism. And it was a, a very touching, obviously. It's one of those little byways of research that don't happen much, but it certainly put a, a face uh, on this memoir that we wrote. I'd like to also share with you another aspect of Malik's memoir that I find very significant. He's writing about his, his father, and he's writing about German-Polish history. And he makes the point that there was a dramatic change since the Nazi takeover. I think this is an important memoir on several levels, but especially in its depiction of an image of Germany and of Germans that could easily have been erased in the history of the new regime. And then he tells, I explicate that, and then he tells this anecdote, which perfectly illustrates it, talking about his father. His father had come to say goodbye to him when he had initially been arrested. And they bid farewell, and he writes, bent over, as if he carried a burden on his wide shoulders. He walks along the poplar-lined road, which is covered by snow. He turns around at the bend. He stops for a moment. It seems that he's hesitating that he intends to turn back, he takes control of himself. He waves his hand, turns around and continues to walk without glancing back again. Three years later, when news reaches me in Dachau about my father being tortured to death, I could still see his tall, broad-shouldered, bent figure walking on this snow-covered road. That was clearly a different era. But I think um, it's important to include in the story of Stutthof, if you're dealing with uh, a large group of priests who were there. After uh, Stutthof, they were sent to Sachsenhausen and then uh, on to uh, Dachau, where many of them uh, died. But we must go on. The next phase brings in, we thought it was hard going to go through those early memoirs and documents. The next phase is, of course, now a full-blown camp and with all the support from the Reich, with the money that they needed. It was fascinating to read the, the uh, exchange that happened between the other camps, like especially Mauthausen, Flossenburg, and they were looking, for example, for good, strong, what they call Berufsverbrecher, these professional, well, I'd call them thugs, and they would send them to the camp and they actually helped the, the SS uh, keep order. So the train records are fascinating about the places uh, that Stutthof was exchanging prisoners or guards uh, with. So um, what about the remaining few Jews then of Danzig and, and Pomerania? Well, there are not many of them left, a few hundred. And um, the head archivist, uh, this is Dr. Danuta Druva, and I am forever grateful for the, um, the way she has supported uh, my research throughout. I've never 
I've never been turned on for any document that I needed, and I'm deeply, deeply uh, grateful. This is what I received from those files about Jews. Uh, there, we're talking about, about maybe 600 Jews, and of them, uh, 300 were murdered in Pomerania. Not in Stutthof, but around Pomerania. And the other really perplexing aspect of my research was the number of camps. They had camps all over the place, not only just for the, the people, for like priests, they had a special camp for them. They had all sorts of camps that were not part of the filial system of Stutthof. They were independent. There is a mound of work to be done by historians in that area, in north, northwestern uh, Poland today. Truly, it is just um, amazing how much we need to be in there. So, um, Druva also makes the claim that what happened to the Jewish population in Danzig, who were so hundreds, dozens exterminated right at the beginning, that it should be it should be better known, obviously, but she actually goes on to say that was Nazi intent. Now this is where, of course, I had to sit down and where is it was it indeed Nazi intent? And I don't think, and I'm sure the historians will, will keep me right in this, there was no actual program for extermination in 1939. So I think the claim uh, is raw. It's a raw claim, and feel, obviously filled with deep emotion here. Um, but I don't think that we can talk at this stage about an actual program, written program, that they were out, the Nazis were out to destroy the Jews in 1939. So what is clear, however, in the next phase uh, which I call here uh, entering the final solution, which I obviously uh, put in inverted commas. And what happened in it? And since we, oh dearie me, we have to, to, to move on here. Um, I would like to, uh, to read from, actually from um, a memoir again. And um, I trust that you're following along with me, that we are now in this, the crucial part of the camp history. We're in 1944. Let's go right there. Wave when my time is, please, Joel, because these are possibly longer excerpts. 19... Uh, 44 July, you know what happened then, the attempted assassination of Hitler, and that brought in dozens of new prisoners. Uh, and that was very interesting because it frankly um, emphasizes how they were seen by the, the, the commandant. They were German, and therefore they had to have a decent a uh, place to stay. Meanwhile, we were getting in others from Denmark and Norway. A, a group of Danish communists arrived and a group of Norwegian policemen. So they assigned in Stutthof then special barracks that they called Germanen Baracken, just for the Germanic races. And it was fascinating to see what these aristocratic Germans had to say about the rest of the camp. That's in there. We can't take the time uh, to share that with you. But when I was working in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, I just by chance it was poking around. I wonder what else I can find here. I found a letter written by the son of uh, von Stauffenberg. 
And he was just a wee, wee fella at this time. And this is what he wrote in, his, in this letter. It was a letter written actually uh, to USHMN. We children were sent to a children's home in the hearts. Adults and young people over 12 were incarcerated and were dragged together from one place to another. At that time, they were also detained in Buchenwald and Stutthof, although isolated from other prisoners. Not half and all, huh? They were certainly isolated in barracks that, that uh, would not be contaminated uh, by anything that was non-German. My grandmother, Anna Baroness von Lerchenfeld, and he gives Ne von Stachelberg, died during this time of internment in Stutthof around the turn of the year 44 to 45. In fact, in looking at other documentation of the death of this uh, dear woman of uh, pneumonia, she didn't die in Stutthof. She died during evacuation of the camp when 50,000 prisoners, about 25,000 of them in Stutthof, and the rest scattered all across, all the way up to Königsberg. And they had to arrange in January of 1945 to pull all these prisoners together. And uh, the Countess actually died uh, during one of these evacuations. An interesting little sidebar. So, like I said, we are in um, the zone of killing. Killing sites is all that you could, could call this. And uh, they are dying of typhus. There were two outbreaks uh, of typhus and uh, very, very severe ones. And uh, many, many died during those typhus outbreaks. My last memoir is taken from a woman called Helen Lewis, a name she acquired. Uh, she's a survivor. Uh, she was born in Czechoslovakia, and she finds herself in Stutthof in 19. Uh, 44, along with thousands and thousands of other Jewish women. After the ghettos and camps, especially Auschwitz, were liquidated, uh, they were sent on marches uh, westward, and Stutthof being in a direct line there, they ended up in Stutthof. This is what Helen Lewis writes. At first sight, Stutthof looked to be an improvement on Auschwitz. The nearby Baltic Sea freshened the air and lent a strange transparency that softened the outlines of the ugly buildings. We had enough room to stretch out at night, but there were no bunks and very few blankets. That changed rapidly. Quickly, they were hauled out of bed. They were sent off to uh, sub camps to work in the fields, uh, to work in the uh, aircraft industry within the camp. And uh, this poor woman barely survived. She was a ballerina. And you'll never guess where she went when she survived. Of all places on earth, Belfast. And this is where she wrote this lovely, lovely memoir. And the North Irish uh, embraced her, took her in, and there's now a wonderful monument in Belfast, which we saw this summer, uh, to Helen Lewis. So it, it gives me um, just a, a few tears to look at that um, to look at that wall where her name is and realize what she came through. We need to end. And uh, I will gladly uh,
take a, a couple of questions, but if I may be permitted to read, because Joel knows me too well, and he knows he would not go through an evening without a poem. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, this is from uh, my Theresienstadt book, and um, it's written by a German Jewish poet, and I translate to take to the roads. To take to the roads, to take in the blades of memory of departed days. The door that shut stands open, bids shooting stars come in and rainbows, companions of the road. A voice makes clear, never again. Releases love's word, a blessing with confessing lips as if an angel spoke to me. We're living in dangerous days of awful anti-Semitism. And uh, I find myself taking out these poems of Theresienstadt and reading them aloud, defiantly. Thank you for your attention. And to the folks out there. Ruth, thank you for that uh, compelling and important lecture. And as you suggested, all too timely um, in so many ways. Um, I'm also struck by how you know the, the international connections from Gdansk to mm -hmm. Germany to Wisconsin, Illinois, Belfast, yeah. and you know what yes. a what a small world this is. Yeah. Um, and um, and so I, I'd like to invite people to ask some questions. We we have a bit of time for that as well. And there there is a there's a microphone going around, so you will be you'll be heard clearly. Uh, just uh, raise your hand, and the mic will magically come to you. Marshall. I have a lot of difficulty geographically uh, comparing Silesia and Pomerania and all these different new names of places that refer basically to the same pace, the Pale of Russia. Uh, and since there was no Poland for 100 years, it's and plus a few, uh, labeling where all these places were is a very difficult job. And as you mentioned, they're finding many, many places that were mini camps or mm -hmm. sub camps or exactly. whatever. And um, truly your book will enlighten us in I that hope, direction. Yeah, and I do, I'm very careful in that. I'm very glad you actually asked that because uh, I decided to um, give the, the, you know, of course they germanized uh, everything that they found. And uh, I, I'm very careful to give the German and the Polish, and any time there was a change there, I, it's there, it's in the book. I hope that would be helpful. I understand in 1940, around 1944, the women of the Kovna ghetto were transported to Stutov. Uh, and in fact, my mother and my aunt were, can, she, can you hear? And my, in fact, my mother and my aunt were transported to Stutov. Um, and uh, of course, you know, they fled when the Allies were bombing. <coughs> And of course they lived, I wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, or they survived, I guess I should say. Do you have any research about that in your book? No, I'm sorry. I'm, I have to, here's a confession. I'm, you know, as you get older, you lose your humor, uh -huh. use your hair and your, your hearing. hearing. It's going, I, I wear a very discreet little uh, hearing aids that, that frankly are useless. So I didn't hear your, your question, but Joe's going to help. Well, 
I'll, I'll give you my audiologist uh, number after the. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, seriously, uh, the, the question was about um, including the, the, the doctor's ancestors um, transported from the Kovner ghetto. Oh, uh, sure. To, yes. There's a lot in here. So could you say there's something? A, yeah, there's a lot in. I had, I had quite a few uh, um, memoirs that I read, and that was a, that was a, frankly, a, a route that came up a lot. And the other thing about people that came from, from uh, Kovno, very often they didn't stay long. And so that's one of the problems with Stutthof that, oh, oh, glory, I forgot about this. Here I am, I'm back. Um, they were moved on again. I mean, these transport lists are almost impossible to decipher. So they would stay for a matter of, of three or four weeks and then move on again. And sometimes they were actually, they came from Auschwitz and after a few weeks or months, they were sent back to Auschwitz. But uh, that, you know, the book has been uh, very, I'm, I'm very grateful for my colleague in, um, my colleague in, um, let me just find her name here, Jurgita uh, Verbikini, who's professor at Vilnius University. And uh, she actually wrote a, a, a lovely little blurb here for me. I met her in Poland. We were both doing uh, not, um, our research was different, but we just gelled immediately and had a wonderful discussion of that. But there, you will find if, uh, if you're interested in, in reading it, it will be in there. I've got a question um, from the from the virtual room. Yes. Um, first, a comment from Jeff Beter, who says, my father's mother and two sisters died in Stutthof, so oh. I am grateful for this attention to a place I only knew of slightly. They were they also were from Kovno. Boy. So very resonant. That's hard. Yes. And then um, were well, sixty-five thousand people perished in Stutthof. Sixty-five thousand. I mean, that is um, that's a lot of. You, you think of towns around here that, ah, uh, just put it like that. Sixty-five thousand perished, and most of them Jewish at the end of uh, forty-four and forty-five. I mean, in these evacuations, nearly half of them died. This was the heart of winter, don't forget that. Going through snow and ice. And if they fell, they were instantly shot. It's one of the hardest reading I've, I've ever uh, had to undertake. Well, and that, that brings me to the next question um, by Tess Maniki, who says, I'm, who asks, I am curious what drew you, what you felt drew you to this camp, the so-called larger camps in quotes, seem to hold such sway when it comes to people writing about them. What about this particular camp made you feel a pull to learn yeah, more? To uh, the question was, um, you know, there, there, are, there are many larger, better known camps that yeah. drew you to this particular camp. Well, um, I think it was divine intervention, <laughs> but that would be a quaint notion. And I think my friend Nigel would just set me down and say, Ruth. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt very, very clearly that when I left Stutthof that day with all that, that, if I can do this, I didn't think I could. And I'll be honest with you, looking back on all these years, I don't know if I would do it again. I really don't. Um, we were over there three times, and um, then we had that um, time with the Polish scholars, um, and that was that was very very enlightening for me. And um, I learned a lot, but it was very humbling to to, to recognize how how little I, I knew. I, I really have left the door wide open for historians to take up this story. I mean, these are perspectives, and they are certainly 
uh, written by a woman who spent a lifetime in literature. And um, I just, I really, I mean, I, I know you all probably enjoy Timothy Snyder's works, and I've, I've read them all. I've done my homework in the history. I certainly have. But I think someone needs to write the history of Stutthof, someone who can work in Polish. You know, we have uh, Dr. Thiessen with us tonight, Bozena Thiessen. I couldn't have done it without her. And uh, Bozena translated, I would find, uh, get documents from the archives and uh, send them to Bozena. And um, which ones do you think are important? That was my first question for my work. And she also had a, a relative uh, living about 20 miles or so from uh, Danzig, who took a picture of a, of a grave, a tombstone uh, near Danzig. And this dear woman sent it then to uh, Bojena, uh, who passed it on to me. And it's a gravestone with a star of David. And it indicates that 30 Jewish women were buried there and perished in March 1945 on a march from Stutthof. Local people tend the grave. I love that. The old Gauleiter of this area, he had boasted that he was going to make the place free of Poles and free of Jews. I write, we know that he did not succeed in his lifetime. This grave shows that he never will. There's unfinished work, very much, yes. How do we get the book? Yeah. I think that, you know, it's awfully expensive. Um, I would go to a library, um, personally. Um, if you insist on, on, on getting the book, the Bloomsbury Press probably has the best, the best price, Bloomsbury. And if you go on their, their website, um, you'll get it there. I, I apologize. I actually have had one complaint already. Why did you make the book so it's, it's, it's academic? It's pathetic, isn't it? But what, what can is, I do? What it is is a reason to fill out the survey cards. <laughs> yes. Oh, do fill that out, then. And for people on Zoom, maybe we can get a few more. To, yes. Ah, uh, I would be. That would be nice. Okay, uh, Ruth. Thank you again. Thank you all uh, for coming. Thank you for your thoughtful questions, um, both online and in person. Um, this has uh, just been a really important way to, to begin the sort of hybrid era, I suppose, of our, um, and God willing, this plague will end. It, you know, pandemics end at some point, right? I, it's not over yet, but um, this is also, I think, a silver lining is that we have we are able to connect to people. It's it's wonderful yes. to see people in person. And please join us for some coffee and and refreshments. Um, but also that we can connect to the wider world. That's and right. uh, and it's good to have people, you know, joining us from from many other places. Yes. Um, Ruth, thank you for you know. Thank you for your support. Those of you, some of you know Ruth as a teacher and colleague and and friend and family member. Um, and those of you who didn't before can see why Rachel was talking in such loving detail about what a beloved teacher you are with such incredibly difficult material. Thank you for taking us through that so sensitively. Thank you, Joe. I did invite the, fri the friars from Pulaski. I phoned and I explained that we were having this at UWM and they took the message, so be lovely if if one of if there's one of them on online tonight to. Uh, 
Well, we will also record this. So if right. they, you know, people who weren't, then they're also, you know, of course, we will send you the link when it's ready. Yes, please. Uh, it will be, we have a YouTube channel uh, that we started fairly recently. There are a few videos there already. Yes. So this will be added to that. And oh, then lovely. anyone who oh. is interested, and I'm sure people will, you know, also just find their way to it. Yes. And I did bring cheaper books about Stutthof. <laughs> uh, this one here <laughs> just came came out, uh, this is written by one of the Norwegians, one of the Norwegian policemen. It's rather nice, there are a couple of uh, errors in it, and it's good that you can spot them. I mean, I, I won't point it out to the person, but at, at least I'm learning something. And then the other one is a very, very important book. I suspect that my colleagues are already uh, familiar with this, Landscapes of the Metropolis of Death. Reflections on Memory and Imagination. It's translated uh, at Otto Dolkulka. I don't know, I'm sure uh, some of you have already read, but his mother is buried uh, near Stutthof. Uh, so he's at uh, Hebrew, he's emeritus also at Hebrew University, but a very powerful book that should be, definitely should be read. So it's cheaper than mine. All right, thank you very, very much.